Hi, I'm Kyle Peterty, VP Commercial Banking and Credit. Welcome to CFI's Fundamentals of Credit course. Credit plays an important role in the lives of many individuals. It's also a key source of external capital for corporations of all sizes and in virtually every industry. Exploring debt as a funding source, analyzing its pros and its cons, and understanding how the assessment process works are important considerations for aspiring financial analysts and credit professionals. In this course, we'll start by looking at what credit is and how it's created. We'll explore some of the different career opportunities available to credit professionals. Then we'll compare different types of interest payments and loan characteristics to better understand what credit structure is. Next, we'll look at what capital expenditure, or CAPEX, is and how debt financing is used to support it, before covering the five C's of credit framework and how it informs risk assessments. And finally, we'll identify the important qualitative and quantitative techniques, including key financial ratios that are used in the analysis and underwriting process. Throughout this course, you'll be watching video lectures, participating in interactive exercises, and working through example amortization schedules in Excel to better understand different payment types and how some important loan characteristics impact those payments. At the end, you'll complete a qualified assessment to test what you've learned. We have a lot of great stuff to cover, so let's get started. What is credit? Credit is created whenever one party receives resources from another without immediately paying for those resources. At the center of this diagram, we have the receiver of credit, also known as the borrower or the debtor. The debtor can receive resources from one of two different types of counterparties, either a direct lender, as shown on the left, like a bank or a credit union, or from a vendor of products or services on the right. Both of those are referred to as credit providers or creditors. With the first example on the left, the lender extends credit to the borrower, either as cash directly or more typically by facilitating the purchase of an asset, like a home for a personal borrower or manufacturing equipment for a commercial borrower. Think about it. When a home buyer purchases a house, they don't actually get cash from the bank to buy the property. The bank facilitates the transaction by sending cash on behalf of its borrower, with the expectation of future repayment, as per some predetermined repayment schedule. It's the same process for most commercial borrowers. This creation of a financial resource is credit, and in this instance, we call it a loan. On the other side of this diagram, we have another form of credit, but it's not a loan per se. We actually have a business that's selling a product or a service to its customer, the debtor, today, but where they are not receiving payment until some time in the future. This is typically referred to as trade credit, as it facilitates trade between two parties. An entire subset of credit analysts work for corporations, and they conduct trade credit analysis for current and prospective buyers of the firm's products or services. For those familiar with basic accounting, a company that is the receiver of trade credit will show an account payable on its balance sheet, which is an amount owing. The provider of trade credit will show an account receivable, as management expects to receive those funds from its customer. So when we refer to credit, we're speaking very broadly about both loans as well as trade credit provided by a vendor. When we talk about credit, which is a promise to pay for something of value later, we are typically talking about either a company or an individual that's taking on that credit. A management team may wish to use credit to help grow and operate their business. Borrowing is generally either short-term in nature, perhaps in support of what we call working capital, such as purchasing inventory to sell and generate revenue. Or it may also be longer term in nature to support investments in growing the business. We'll cover both of these categories shortly. And of course, on the other side, we have individuals, which in banking is often called retail lending. Individuals use credit. 
They may have credit cards for managing their day-to-day expenses, or they may have longer-term loans like car loans or mortgages. Because we are the Corporate Finance Institute, our course content will focus primarily through the lens of corporate or commercial lending, but we'll also try to provide lots of personal or retail credit examples to help illustrate important points, since they tend to be familiar for people. We often think of individuals borrowing money when they don't have enough cash on hand to make a purchase, such as a home. Most people don't pay cash for big ticket items like a house. These mortgage loans would be paid back over 25, maybe 30 years, making the monthly obligation much more manageable for an individual. When it comes to commercial credit, however, there's a little more nuance. First, there are some strategic reasons why a management team may wish to use debt in its capital structure. And second, there are also some practical reasons. We'll look at strategic reasons in the next lesson. But practically speaking, companies borrow money to make investments that will generate future revenue and presumably future cash flow. As a result, commercial lenders and credit analysts are often tasked with structuring credit such that the repayments of the loan, which are cash outflows for the borrower, align as closely as possible to the cash inflows generated by the underlying investments. And when we say investments, we don't mean stocks and bonds, but rather investments in the business, which are assets. Let's look at an example balance sheet. Management needs to purchase inventory to sell, and they must also invest in property, plant, and equipment to operate. This is known as CapEx, which is short for capital expenditures, things like manufacturing equipment, commercial real estate, and so on. Without getting too far into accounting fundamentals, since CFI has lots of terrific accounting courses, assets are things that a company owns. Liabilities are things that a company owes. In this case, if you look at the liability section on the balance sheet, you'll see the two forms of credit we covered in the first lesson. Trade credit, here shown as an account payable, as well as bank debt, or loans, shown here as long-term debt. This means that the firm owes both its suppliers as well as its creditors. Inventory can only be sold once, making it a current asset. Current assets are those that will be converted to cash within 12 months. As a result, this current asset is typically financed using a current liability, in this case trade credit, or suppliers. But it could also come in the form of an operating line from a bank. Property, plant, and equipment, on the other hand, is a category of long-term asset, meaning that the useful life is greater than 12 months. This is another way of saying that they can be used more than once and they will generate revenue for the company and cash flow for greater than 12 months. As such, credit extended to support the acquisition of these long-term assets is usually paid back over longer periods of time. There are three ways a company can fund its operations or its investments. The first is with cash that it already has on the balance sheet. If the company doesn't have enough cash, then it can either issue equity by creating new shares and selling them to investors and getting that money from those investors as cash that it can use. Or it can use credit or debt and take the money that it gets from the creditors to fund its new projects and initiatives. So these are the three sources, cash that it already has, new equity, or new credit. Let's take a look at the pros and the cons of each, starting with cash. Cash is always accepted as a source of funding for a project or a purchase. That goes without saying. It's very liquid, which means it can be accessed immediately and there's no cost to getting the cash that a company already has, other than the opportunity cost of not being able to invest it in something else. On the flip side, companies generally don't keep very large cash balances that management can access when they have a big project to execute. It's also a common strategy for management teams to try and preserve the cash that they do have in case of emergencies, more so than spending on projects. In business and finance, you'll often hear cash is king. So it's a balance between 
keeping enough cash for emergencies, but not leaving excessive cash that could be used to fund new capex. This is why it's common for businesses to seek an external source of funding for growth initiatives, like equity or debt. Now, let's look at equity. If a company doesn't have enough cash on hand already, it could consider raising equity. In order to do that, it would issue shares of its common stock and sell them to investors. This can be good for companies that don't have access to debt or that aren't able to borrow money. It's good for high-risk businesses or high-risk projects where debt is maybe not a suitable funding option. And equity does not have an ongoing requirement to pay interest, and principal doesn't have to be repaid either. But equity is more expensive than debt because it's higher risk. Since investors are taking more risk with equity, they need to be compensated with a higher expected rate of return. So even though the cost of equity is not a direct cost like interest expense or a direct use of cash like principal repayments, it's a high implied cost. By issuing equity, management is giving away ownership and control of the business, as well as their right to some of the firm's future profits. For that reason, many management teams and owners of businesses typically want to issue as little equity as they can. Once a company has issued equity to outside investors, they're accountable to those stockholders. They need to provide them with ongoing financial information, as well as access to decision-making, or perhaps even board representation, depending on how much equity is sold and to whom. Another con is that issuing equity can also be a complicated and expensive process, and is not always practical for small and medium-sized companies that are privately owned, as opposed to being publicly traded. The third potential funding source is credit, or debt, it's also good for long-term project funding, just like equity or cash. The interest payments on a credit facility are tax deductible, so using debt can concurrently reduce a firm's tax obligations. Further, unlike equity, borrowing money won't dilute existing shareholders or change the ownership structure of the company. It's also cheaper than equity because it's a lower risk source of funding. More on this next lesson. So you can see, there's definitely a strategic rationale for employing debt to support a company's growth plans. On the flip side, when a business uses debt, management must pay very careful attention to liquidity. Interest and principal repayments must be made, and so managing cash flow becomes imperative. Also, if the company is somewhat higher risk, it's possible that the interest rate could be quite high. Debt also adds financial risk to a business. Debt can cause serious solvency issues, unlike equity which cannot push a company into default or insolvency. And finally, debt also sometimes comes with certain restrictions called covenants. These are sort of like rules set in place by a lender, stipulating things that the borrower can't do, or must do, in order to help manage credit risk. So, in summary, companies trade off between these three sources of funding, but you can see some clear strategic reasons why a management team may wish to use debt instead of equity as a preferred source of external funding. With the understanding now that debt and equity are the only two external sources of funding available to a company, let's touch on why debt is considered a lower risk and therefore a cheaper source of capital than equity. The best way to help visualize this is through a corporate finance concept called the capital stack, where you can visualize different funding sources being stacked on top of each other. The higher a funding source is on the capital stack, the more senior it is, and therefore the lower risk it is from the perspective of that capital provider. The lower it is in the capital stack, the higher risk it is. While there are a variety of unique, hybrid, and sometimes exotic funding sources, like subordinated debt, mezzanine financing, preferred shares, and so on, they all basically fall into the two main categories we already covered, equity and debt. At the very bottom of this capital stack is equity, common shares specifically. At the very top is debt, senior debt specifically. Because of this seniority, earnings are paid out to creditors ahead of stockholders, both in good times and in bad. And here's what we mean by good times. If you look at this example income statement, you'll see a healthy, profitable company. 
you'll notice that interest is paid out of EBIT, earnings before interest and taxes here. Then taxes, and then common shareholders are paid, finally their dividend last, out of the net earnings, after interest and taxes, all the way down at the bottom of the income statement. And what do we mean by bad times? Well, a creditor, be it a bank, an equipment finance firm, or a different private non-bank lender, registers a charge against its borrower's assets, which makes them collateral. This means that by way of a public registry, which varies by jurisdiction, it's made publicly known that this lender has a charge over some, or perhaps all, of that borrower's assets. In the event that this company stopped making loan payments and ceased operations, claims against the company's assets would be made and paid in priority from the top to the bottom of this capital stack, meaning that the most senior lenders get to grab, seize, and sell the collateral assets first to recoup outstanding loan proceeds, followed by whichever capital provider is below them in the capital stack, and so on. You can imagine that by the bottom of the stack, there's not much left in the way of residual assets for common shareholders. This is what we mean when we say that debt is a less risky source of funding than equity, since when everything falls apart, creditors have a much better chance of getting repaid their principal, whereas equity investors do not. This is another reason why their return expectations are that much higher.